This lecture is part of a series of lectures on rings and modules and will be about Hilbert's finiteness theorems about notarian rings. So we recall that a ring R is notarian um, means either all ideals are finitely generated and it also means that if you've got an increasing sequence of ideals that's strictly increasing any such sequence must be finite in length. And um, what we want to do is to find some more examples of notarian rings. In particular, we first want to prove Hilbert's theorem, which says that if you've got a field of polynomials in several variables, then this is notarian. And in fact, Hilbert also showed that even if you take polynomials with integer coefficients, this is notarian. Um, Hilbert's original proofs of these were, were a little bit complicated. Um, Noetta found a much easier way of proving them, which was just to show that if R is notarian, this implies that the ring of polynomials in R is also notarian. And now you can see Hilbert's theorems follow immediately from this because we know K is notarian, so this implies the ring of polynomials in one variable is notarian by applying Noetta's theorem. And this implies the ring of polynomials in two variables is notarian because this is just a ring of polynomials in one variable over a ring of polynomials in one variable. And so you can keep going like this and find all polynomial rings are notarian. Um, so, so suppose R is notarian and I is an ideal of R of X, we want to show that I is finitely generated as an ideal. And to do this, we, we first write down a sequence of ideals of R. So, so we have the ideal I0 <coughs> is going to be the ideal, this is in R, not in R of X, of um, leading coefficients of degree zero elements of the ideal i. Um, uh, you may think this is a rather cumbersome way of saying the, the elements of i that are in the ring r, but the reason for this is that this um, uh, uh, generalizes better to um, higher subscripts. So this is going to be the ideal in r of leading coefficients of degree one elements of i. And i2, uh, well it's not, it doesn't take too much imagination, um, we get degree 2 elements and so on. And now we notice that i0 is contained in i1, is contained in i2 and so on. Um, this is because if f is in i n, then x times f is in i n plus 1 and has the same leading coefficients. So um, now we notice that since this is an increasing chain, it must eventually stabilize. So for some n, we have i n equals i n plus one equals i n plus two and so on. So, so all ideals from some point onwards become the same. Um, and now we can write down a finite set of generators of i. So um, the set is going to consist of the following things. First of all, we take um, um, a finite set of degree zero polynomials whose leading coefficient generate I zero, which we can do because I zero is finitely generated as an ideal of R. And then we take another finite set of degree one polynomials whose leading coefficients generate I1, which we can do because I1 is finitely generated. And we keep going like this up to N. So we take a finite set of degree N polynomials whose leading coefficients generate I N. And now we've got a finite collection of finite sets. So, here we have a finite set of generators. And now, now, we, now we need to show these generate i. 
So we pick f in i and we show by induction, we're going to use induction on degree of f um, to show that f is generated by the, 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 the generating set above. And the key point is we can find a polynomial, so, so we can find um, a polynomial of the form x to the something times an element of the generating set times um, some element in R with the same leading coefficient as f. So if f has degree at most n, we can just um, immediately use some element of the generating set times so some linear combination of elements of the generating set times something in R. Um, so it should take a finite sum of things like that. And if f has degree greater than n, then this doesn't matter because you can just take the elements of i n and multiply them by powers of x and um, um, get, get i i n plus anything you like. So by induction on the degree, you, you can keep reducing the degree of f by killing off its leading coefficient by some linear combination of these polynomials. And by going on like that, you reduce f to zero. So that, that proves Hilbert's theorem that um, polynomial rings are notarian. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this lecture is to give an application of this to another finiteness theorem of Hilbert, which is that rings of invariants are often finitely generated as algebras. So I'll explain what this means and then give Hilbert's proof of this. So um, the, the general problem is that suppose we have a group G acting on a vector space. Um, and this will usually be finite dimensional. Um, and then G acts on the um, algebra of polynomials on the vector space V. So if the dual of V contains elements is, is spanned by as a basis X1 up to Xn, then this um, algebra of polynomials on V will just be the polynomial algebra in X1 up to Xn. And we can look at the ring of invariants, um, which will be denoted by Kx1 up to Xn G. This is just the polynomials um, fixed by G. And the following problem is, is this invariant ring a finitely generated algebra. So this was um, one of the big open questions near the end of the 19th century. So let's start by giving a couple of examples of this. So the first example, let's take G to be the symmetric group, um, Sn, and let's take v to be just an n-dimensional vector space. We may as well work over the complex numbers. And then we can um, we want the invariants uh, are going to consist of all polynomials in variables x1 up to xn, which are fixed by Sn, which means polynomials that don't change if you permute these variables x1 to xn. So here are some examples. So obviously, if we take the sum of x1 up to xn, that doesn't change. We can take the sum of all pairs of elements and so on. So this is going to be sum of i less than j of x i x j. Or we can take sum of all triples, i less than j less than k x i x j x k. And we can keep going like this until we get up to x1 up to xn. And these are obviously all invariant under permutations. They're, they're, they're called the elementary symmetric functions. And these are actually generators 
for the ring of all invariant functions. For example, here's another invariant function. We can take x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared. And this is a polynomial in these basic invariants. We can just write it as x1 plus x2 and so on, all squared, and then subtract twice the sum of the xij's. Um, so here's another example. Let's take g to be the cyclic group of order 4 and v to be um, two-dimensional. So we're, we're going to be looking at an action of g on the ring of polynomials in two variables. And suppose that g, little g, is a generator for this. We're just going to say little g of x is equal to ix and little g of y is equal to i times y, where i squared is equal to minus 1. And then we want to know what are the what are the invariants. Well, let's sort of draw a picture of the ring of polynomials. We'll just draw a basis of it. We have 1x, x squared, x cubed, x to the 4, and get y, y squared, y cubed, y to the 4. And then we have all these other monomials. So here's x, y, and here's x cubed, y, and so on. And you can see that the action of g is going to multiply things here by i, and things here by i squared, and things here by i cubed, and things here by i to the 4 equals 1, and so on. So the ring of invariants will, will, be, will, will be spanned by these things, and by these things, and by these things which go up to x to the 8, and so on. And, it, and if you look at this, it's not very difficult to find a set of generators. A set of generators will be all the, all the monomials of degree 4 that we've written down here. So the x to the 4, x cubed, y, x squared, y squared, x, y cubed, and y to the 4. So here we found a finite set of five generators for the ring of invariants. Notice the number of invariants of the number of generators of the invariant ring may be quite a lot more than the number of generators of the ring you started off with. Um, in fact, the number of generators of an invariant ring in general turns out to be really huge. Um, the two cases I've given where g is the symmetric group or the, or the um, little group of order 4 are, are, are misleadingly easy cases. And I'm not giving you the general case because most of the time the ring of invariance is just too complicated to write down explicitly. Um, the, case, the, the, the sort of case that Hilbert was actually looking at where we take g to be an infinite group like say SL2 of the complex numbers, the special linear group of all matrices A, B, C, D with determinant equal to 1. And you might, for instance, look at the action of this on binary quantics. So what is a binary quantic? Well, it's something that looks like a n x d n plus a n minus 1 x d n minus 1 y plus, plus a 0, a 0 y to the n. So binary means two variables and quantic means you're not really quite sure what the degree is. Anyway, g acts on um, x and y by um, a b c d of x y is a x plus b y c x plus d y. Um, but it's not the action on this two-dimensional space we're interested in. What this does is we get an action of g on the vector space spanned by a0 up to a n, because if you act on g by a quantic, you're changing it to another quantic, and this is just a linear transformation of the ai's. So an invariant is going to be a polynomial in a0 up to a n, that is invariant under, under the action of G. And the, and the problem Hilbert was looking at was trying to show that rings of invariance of this action of G are finitely generated. Well, actually, this particular case was solved by Gordon, um, the ring of invariance is a finitely generated algebra. Um, Gordon, by the way, is the same Gordon who turns up in, in Klebsch Gordon go coefficients in quantum mechanics, and he, uh, that's also related to invariant theory. Um, so, Gordon's proof of this was terrifyingly complicated, and 
Um, obviously, instead of looking at SL2 acting on forms in two variables, you want to do more complicated things like look at SLN acting on forms in N variables. So this, this was the big open problem in invariance here at the end of the 19th century. Show that rings of invariance similar to this one are finitely generated. And Hilbert absolutely wiped the floor with this problem and uh, apparently he kind of quite upset quite a lot of people because you know, there, there were several experts in invariant theory who devoted their lives to doing these incredibly complicated calculations with invariants. I mean, invariants can be really complicated. I mean, some of the papers listing invariants, the invariants would be half a page or a page long. It was a real nightmare calculating with them. Anyway, let's see how Hilbert um, 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 solved this problem. So, um, um, in general, we should notice that a subring of a polynomial ring need not be finitely generated. So let's first of all look at the following example. Suppose you look at the ring of polynomials in two variables, and you just look at the following um, following subring. Let's draw a picture of it so you can see what's going on. So here's one x x squared x cubed y y squared x y, and so on. And now I'm going to draw a subalgebra. Um, as follows, I'm just going to take the linear combination of all things here, and this is a subalgebra that is not finitely generated as an algebra, which is not too difficult to check. So, so this is the problem we've got to deal with. In general, subalgebras of a ring of polynomials need not be finitely generated, and we've got to find some way of showing that the rings of invariance are not of this, this rather tiresome form. And the key extra property that these subalgebras have is the existence of something called a Reynolds operator. Um, now, in order to define a Reynolds operator, um, I can't do it for all groups. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the field to be the complex numbers. And I don't really need it to be the complex numbers. All I need is that it is characteristic equal to zero. And I'm going to take my group G to be finite. Um, so Hilbert was working with infinite groups. For simplicity, I'm just going to do the case of finite groups. And the Reynolds operator, which is, this is a row for Reynolds, you just take the average over the group G. So if I've got any function, the Reynolds operator applied to F is just the sum over all G of uh, G acting on the function divided by the order of the group G. Um, so uh, obviously we, in order for this to work we need the group to be finite so this sum is well defined and we need characteristic zero because um, we need to be able to divide by the order of the group G and if, if G had order P and we were working over a field of characteristic P this would fail and in fact Reynolds operators don't always exist in characteristic greater than zero. And it has some basic properties. Of um, rho, um, first of all, um, rho of one is equal to one. That's kind of really obvious. More generally, rho of f is equal to f if f is fixed by the group G. And that's kind of obvious because you're just taking the average of f under g. More generally still, if we take rho of fg, you can check this as f times rho of g whenever f is fixed by g. So, so this, is, this is really the key property we need. Plus, I guess we need the property that rho of 1 equals 1 so that we know the operator isn't identically 0. Um, so now with the Reynolds operator, we can we can try and prove Hilbert's theorem. So, so, um, so, so we, we, we've got the ring of polynomials in n variables, and this is acted on by on by the group G. And we're going to let R be the ring of invariants. And we want to prove that R is finitely generated as an algebra. And we notice that. Um, key point is that r is graded. r is equal to r0, direct some r1, direct some r2. So 
um, Rn is homogeneous things of degree n. It's kind of easy to check that if you've got an invariant, it splits up as a sum of invariants of various degrees. And I'm going to define the ideal i to be the ideal of kx1 to xn generated by r1, r2, r3, and so on. And this isn't a misprint. We should notice that r0 is missing. And we'd better miss out r0 because r0 contains 1. So if we put 1 in here, then the ideal i would just be the whole ring of invariants. And now we notice that i is a finitely generated ideal of um, the, 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 the polynomial ring kx1 up to xn. And we're going to pick um, a set, a finite set, i1 up to in of homogeneous generators. Of i, and we want to show that i1 up to i n generate. So I should say homogeneous generators of i in. In it, uh, we can pick them in the subring r, and I want to show that these generate r. And um, if you're not paying attention, you might think this is kind of obvious because the ideal i actually contains r, so surely if i1 up to i n generate i, they must generate r. Well, there's a subtlety here. So these are generators of i as an ideal, but here I want to generate r as an algebra. And generating something as an algebra is much harder than generating it as an ideal. For instance, if I go back to this example here, I've got this subalgebra. Now, if I, if I look at the ideal generated by all elements of degree greater than zero, I've just got this ideal here. So here I've got an ideal i, and this ideal i is certainly finitely generated by y, but y does not generate the subalgebra. So um, there's a really important difference between generating something as an ideal or generating something as an algebra. They're, they're, they're different conditions. In fact, th th there, there are several other conditions. You could also talk about being finitely generated as a field or finitely generated as a module. And all these four concepts of being finitely generated are all different. So we've got to go from being finitely generated as an ideal to being finitely generated as an algebra. And to do this, well, as we've seen, it doesn't work for all rings. Um, so we, we're going to have to use the Reynolds operator. So, so, so let's show that I1 to In generate R as an algebra. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick F in R and we, we might say it's homogeneous. And we may as well take its degree to be greater than zero because degree zero are just, uh, are just constants, which we, we, we already know are, um, well, well, they're already in the algebra generated by this. And now um, f is in the ideal i, so f is equal to um, r, uh, let's call it a1 i1 plus, plus a n i n for some a i in the polynomial ring k x 1 to um, I guess I'm using number m in two different ways here. Um, so I can write f as a linear combination of uh, these things where these are the generators of the ideal i that I've picked here and these are just um, elements of the polynomial ring. And notice that the ai need not be in our subring r. If they were, then we would have finished. We would have shown that f is, is, is but, but by induction on the degree, we'd have shown that f is now in the algebra generated by the i's. Now, we are, uh, now the key point of the proof is we apply the Reynolds operator row. And we find f um, 
is equal to rho of f because f is an invariant and this is equal to rho a1 um, times i1 plus um, up to plus rho a m times i m. Um, so we notice that um, we, we, we assumed that all the i's were invariant. So by the property of the Reynolds operator, um, rho of this is just equal to rho of a1 times i1 and so on. And now we notice that rho a1 up to rho a m are in the ring R because they are uh, they are invariant. So by induction on the degree that they are polynomials in I1 up to I n. Um, here we're using the fact that the invariants I1 that the elements I1 up to I m all have degree at least one which means these elements rho a1 up to rho a m have degree less than the degree of f. So we, we can indeed imply induction on the degree. And now we've written f as a polynomial in the invariance i1 up to i m by induction, because we know that these elements are also polynomials in i1 up to i m. So, so f is polynomial in I1 up to I M. So the subring R is generated by I1 up to I M. Um, so that's the proof of Hilbert's theorem. And it's, it's really rather amazing because it's almost one line long once you've um, proved the basic properties of the Noetherian rings. You're just going from, from this expression here to this expression here. And as I said, this, this apparently trivial calculation wiped out hundreds of pages of gruesome calculations in invariant theory. Um, so I'll just finish by saying a little bit more about what Hilbert did. Um, so this is Hilbert's theorem for finite groups. Um, we would like to extend it to infinite groups. Notice that the same proof works for compact groups. And the point is for a compact group, you can define the Reynolds operator of f. Instead of summing over the group, you integrate over the group. Um, um, and you can integrate over the gr group because the group is compact and this function is continuous. And you can integrate continuous functions over compact groups. Well, that doesn't really help much because, at first sight, because groups like SL2C are not compact. However, there's a really clever idea due to Weil called the Unitarian trick, which reduces non-compact groups like this to certain compact groups. So we notice that SL2C contains the, um, the special unitary group. Um, this is two by two unitary matrices of determinant one, and unitary groups are compact. And then um, it's not very difficult if you know a little bit about Lie algebras to show that these two groups have essentially the same invariance, at least in the cases that Hilbert was looking like. And technically, if you take the Lie algebra of this, um, um, I guess that should be SU2 of the reals, not of the complex numbers. If you take the Lie algebra of this and complexify it, you get the Lie algebra of that. Um, but that's um, that's done in a Lie algebra course rather than an introductory algebra course. Um, so by using this idea, um, you can extend Hilbert's finiteness theorem to all sorts of groups like SLN of the complex numbers and more generally um, any reductive Lie group, whatever that means. Um, so uh, Hilbert seems to have thought at first that his um, finiteness theorem might be extendable to all groups. And one of the famous 23 problems he asked was whether you can prove invari finiteness of invariance for all group actions. Nagata actually found examples of groups G so that the invariant ring um, Kx1 to Kxn of G is not finitely generated. Um, 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 the, the, the other 
um, condition we had was that we were working over a field of the complex numbers, or at least a field of characteristic zero, in order that you could define a Reynolds operator. Um, over fields of non-zero characteristic, it's rather more difficult because a linear Reynolds operator doesn't exist in general. Um, but Noether for finite groups and um, Habouche for infinite groups um, extended Hilbert's theorem um, for characteristic greater than zero. So the, the characteristic zero assumption isn't really essential, although it does greatly simplify the proofs. Um, okay, I think that's enough about finiteness theorems for notarian rings.